actividad de los viernes geocientíficos en esta oportunidad con el tema de recursos geotérmico y su aplicación para el Perú. Esta presentación estará a cargo del doctor Masami Nakawaya, él es profesor de la Escuela de Minas de Colorado, Estados Unidos, especialista en geotermia del mundo y actual profesor de minas, como antes mencioné, eh, de Colorado en Estados Unidos, profesor asociado de investigación. La presentación va a ser en inglés para la comunidad del expositor. Bueno, así vamos con Juan Espanas.
And uh, so my, I like, I wanted to do um, um, the mining on the, on the surface of the moon. And then, um, we, we do not have enough time to talk about this, but because the moon is very, very interesting. And we have so much resource on the moon. And uh, we are not able to use it. So when that time comes, I will go to the moon. Uh, um, so what is, uh, is there anybody geologist here? So, um, so I still, uh, I can still give a lecture on, on geothermal because most of you are not working in, in this area. Right? So, so what is geothermal energy? And um, um, but I like to give this this lecture in a larger context. The geothermal is nothing but a part of natural resources. Yeah. And um, um, the sustainability and the capacity building. This is the main trend in the US at least. Because I have seen many, many geothermal development projects have failed, not because of the technical issues, but because of community opposes. And that's because we, most of them did not do a, a sort of good, good enough education for the community. And sending the message that we are developing resources together. So the old message that we have money, we have resources, we go there and develop a geothermal energy. This will never be accepted in the US So the main issue is that how do you do what we want to do, develop natural resources or develop geothermal resources in this context in such a way that the communities benefit. Okay? And I have seen in many, uh, many, well, some locations in New Zealand, for example, they have 150 megawatts of geothermal power plant, but right next to it, there's no electricity. And that's strange, isn't it? So this happens often, and um, we want to avoid that. Local community have to accept or embrace the future of the world. And, and, and in order for, uh, for us to accomplish it, we have to have an integrated approach, at least the vision of that approach, before we start doing anything. And I have learned this uh, working with the uh, mining operations. In particular, uh, there's a big uh, silver mine in southern uh, uh, Bolivia of Minerals and Cristobal. And this uh, big mine is actually owned by a Japanese company. And uh, the way they do, uh, well, there are problems, but the way they do is to integrate sustainability vision into a business. So, um, so far, it's been working uh, reasonably well. So, the big picture um, of geothermal resources, at least the locations of geothermal resources, are like right here, and uh, for the case of Peru, Chile, yeah, and to a certain extent, Bolivia, and also places like this in Hawaii, Iceland. So first thing you look for is some kind of volcanic activities. And um, um, so for a um, country like Peru, for example, there is a subduction zone, there is a continental plate, 
these two planes rub each other, so there's a lot of heat generated in that location, and it melts fast and uh, become a, a magmatic source for, uh, for the heat. And when the, when the situation is right, then it appears as a, a volcano. For that reason, uh, geothermal power generations are, um, have been done in these countries or in these areas. This what we call the ring of fire, for the, for the reason that, that I just said. And also, the most recent um, attention has been focused on the eastern uh, African countries, Ethiopia, Kenya. Not so much because of uh, uh, the resource per se, but I think it will be more a geopolitical reasons. And the United States um, is, is far behind in joining the rest of the world in, in looking at uh, the resources in Eastern East Africa. But this is where current and the focus on the international focus on Japan is, is out. Now if you have any questions please ask me and before we go too far. And uh, <coughs> this is a typical uh, geothermal power plant in Japan. So when when you visit geothermal power plant this is what you see, and it's not small. It's uh, steam. Okay, so it's water basically. So it's it's clean, and the geothermal energy or geothermal power is 24/7. They don't rest. It doesn't depend on the, on the weather. It doesn't depend on the day and night cycle. So one of the biggest um, selling point by the geothermal resource developer is saying that geothermal is a base load. Right? So other um, renewable energy like solar and wind, they are intermittent. So Speaking about geothermal energy, you need three things. One is obviously heat, and the second thing is water. We need water to bring the heat from underground. Right? It's, it's a carrier of, of energy. And we need to look for a location where there's enough permeability. Or, um, Yeah, permeability in crop. So, uh, a little bit of a complicated picture of a geothermal reservoir should look like this. Yeah, we said we go near the volcano because obviously there's a heat and we also need water, remember? Where do we get water? Most of the time, you get water from rain. And this rain water has to go underground. And the way it, go, it does that is to follow the fall. So we look for a volcano, and we also we do a lot of geological mapping, satellite mapping, and to identify where the fault zone. Once we know this, then we do. We have to understand how the movement of water. Okay. But remember, we are talking about not 100 meters, 200 meters. We are talking about tens of kilometers distance. Now, so suppose that rainwater can follow. Here, and it 
as it goes down, it starts picking up heat. What? Picking up the temperature from here or from here. So cold water, which is heavy water, becomes lighter. Right? When water becomes harder, it loses density, so it becomes lighter. So it starts going up. And this action of going up is um, uh, for two reasons. One is, remember, there is a large column of cold water, which is heavy. This whole thing is uh, pushing the lighter water upward, right? So it just uh, moving like this. And with the hope that there is a, a fault or bedrock, which can turn this water into the output. Right? If there is nothing, um, no structure here, then and, and this force is infinitely long, it just keeps going down. So there has to be some turning mechanism. Two, geologic condition, and also hydrological condition. Very heavy water is pushing the lighter water is the warm water. Now, another thing is that this hot water has to go up following another fault. Right? And so if the conditions are right, the geological conditions are right, we can identify a location bounded by two mid Say in this case, two folds that, that, that are responsible to bring the hot water upwards. And, but we need something else. We need what, what we call cap flow, which caps the movement of hot water. If you don't have this, then it, it will go, it keeps going up. And sometimes, maybe, it, it, it you know, uh, mixed with the uh, uh, Cold water right here, which is in the shallow aquifer. So, bounded by the above, by cap rock, and boundaries on the side of the falls, and boundaries at the bottom of the falls. Lots of heat from underground. So, there, is a, there will be a large movement of water in this geothermal aquifer. Now, if the rock here is not permeable, then there will be no water here, first of all, and there will be no movement of water. Right? So the permeability, not necessarily porosity, but the permeability is a very, very important measure of the performance of the aquifer, geothermal reason. So, um, oh, right. And uh, this is also very, very important. <coughs> now, yes, so we, once we set up a power generating plant here, then the spent water is now the cold water, and if we want to re inject this in such a way that this will join replenish the geothermal reserve, just like the rainy water does. So in a large scale, in a global scale, well, there's no water hopefully wasted. The only thing that we take is heat, right? So in the United States, uh, the, the current discussion is that who owns the heat? So we are opening another interesting discussion. We know we are still debating who owns water, who owns mineral, but we are discussing who owns the heat. So I started, I started doing a lecture on heat mining, and this is the different types of mining. We do not actually take anything from underground, but we take the heat. And if you, if you focus on this concept, you start seeing a very different types of mining. For example, 
in, in my state, Colorado, state of Colorado, we have over 40 burning underground coal seams. These are natural fires happen in underground. And um, um, you know, these four five underground coal fires are nothing but problems right now because it emits methane, it emits CO2, it emits a lot of gases. And it gets too hot. And, and once it gets going, it's very difficult to stop. So we are watching this energy, the heat, together with the uh, greenhouse gases being emitted, not doing anything. So I, I started doing a project um, which is called um, um, Shallow Geothermal um, uh, Project. We can use this heat to do the geothermal. Exactly the same way as well. So in, tip, a typical, um, in a typical sense, a typical hydrothermal geothermal, we have to drill 1.1 kilometers, 2 kilometers deep. But these four fires, just live, I mean, and under 150 meters below. So the drilling cost is nothing to compare to what we have to do. Picture. And the temperature, you can get 700 degrees C, much higher than, than the typical geothermal resources. So what it does, what, what this underground burning course it does is that it can shrink the size of the turbines because of the higher temperature and then reduce the cost of the drilling. But somehow the government doesn't want to do it. Okay, so there is some legal issues, and, and uh, um, but, but I think all we need is the one small successful project to start something like this. Okay? Now, going back to geothermal. There are basically three different types of, uh, uh, three different ways to generate power. And the first one is called dry steam power plant. And this is how actually the geothermal power generation started in 1905 in Italy, La There were Their resource was good enough just to have steam, dry steam from underground. Not the wet steam, but the wet uh, hot water, just like what we do now. So they took steam out of the ground and sent that steam to the turbine. And uh, so the steam expand when it goes from very, very narrow pipe to a big turbine space, it expands. And that expansion movement is responsible to turn the turbine. It's not like water hitting the turbine plate. So this is a very, very different way to turn, turn the turbine machine. The difference between the hydro power and the geothermal power is, is this. Okay. And this turbine is connected to the generator and any Remember, this steam, after it used the kinetic energy to turn the turbines, it becomes cold water again. So it condenses, and we want to send this condensed steam, or now it's water, back into the reservoir. So in terms of the water usage, this is closed. So this is the first type of um, power generation. And the second type is flash steam power plant. Now, we do not, um, I think most of the good dry steam geothermal reservoirs have been found. And at least in the, in the United States, we know we don't have any. The biggest and the best example is, uh, guys, is, is the geyser uh, apartment in North, uh, San Francisco, in California. 
which was originally designed to produce 2.6 gigawatts of electricity, but now over the years, they have not maintained the reservoir health so that we can only be to, uh, produce six to 700 megawatts of electricity. So what they decided to do is to borrow the waste water from San Francisco or neighboring cities, start injecting into the reservoir. So the reservoir management is very, very important. That is why, I'll go back to this picture, that is why you really have to understand where is the water is coming from, how does it move, and the permeability of the rock inside there. So it's almost like having a, a big, big machinery underground, which you cannot see. So dry steam, flash steam, oh by the way, just one comment here. This hot water is sent to the tank called flash tank. That's where the flash, uh, where hot water becomes a uh, mixture of steam and hot water. Remember, we only want to use steam inside the tank, no water. So as dry steam, it is the better the performance. Of the, of the trunk. So try to get as much dry steam here and send it to turbine, but hot water is, is already sent to the underground. And this water now is mixed with the condensed steam and is sent back to the ground. Right? So again, try to make it renewable. The most modern um, geothermal power plant is binary cycle and as you can see now we can pretty much count on, on getting only hot water and we get hot water here and we use this loop here and using a heat exchanger we only borrow the heat from this hot water so there's no reason for us to flush it in this loop here but we still want to have steam of some kind, right? So there is another loop here with a binary liquid. Most likely, this binary liquid are the mixture of water and ammonia. As you know, ammonia has a very, very low boiling temperature, so you don't need a hundred degrees C or whatever boiling temperature here. Or so the mixture between the ammonia and the water is going around here. It takes the heat from this hot water and expands, and then finally it goes into the turbine. And again, it, the expansion movement of this mixture is responsible for turning the turbine. Now, this con in the con um, just the concept, it. it looks very, very good. But the, one of the difficulties is to maintain the right mixture between ammonia and the water concept, to maintain that. Because we are talking about the phase diagram of uh, uh, this mixture is very, very good. Uh, it's not straight. So, there are two parts, underground and above ground. And we have much better handle with the power plant for efficiency, but this is still a very, very high risk. And I think that's why you are all working in, in mostly in, in this area, subsurface understanding of the natural resources. And accepting one, which is actually a drill for any other measurements are, 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 will give us an indirect understanding of what we have done. Okay. So, um, this is what we have. We try to understand what's underneath, and um, um, our drilling cost is, is getting more and more expensive.
Um, So geothermal exploration techniques, uh, I heard um, that this group that does already um, geothermal exploration. But the, the question is, remember, we, we talked about this, but what is the scale of this? It's a very, very big scale. And the geothermal reservoir is we are talking about a few kilometers at most. So how do you how do you place how do you set the location where you can get the best benefit out of the So uh, designing or understanding of geothermal reservoir two biggest challenges. One is the inhomogeneity of the underground. You don't have just one rock. Different types of rocks with different material properties, different folds, compression zone, extension zone, so all these mechanical, geological, hydrological, chemical, everything is together. And this I have I have never seen a complicated phenomenon like this. Even NASA would not touch it because it's too complicated. Trouble. So um, the classification of geothermal reservoirs, um, in terms of temperature, we go 200 degrees above high temperature, uh, less than 150 low temperature. But this definition changing all the time. Right? So in uh, um, China hot springs, for example, in Alaska, they can, using a binary <coughs> power plant, they can use 80 degrees uh, water temperature. Now they, they are producing electricity. I think it, it's, a, it's a, a very, very exceptional case because in Alaska, they have access to a very, very cold water. The temperature difference between the uh, um, power plant and the environment is very, very big. And that helps to come up with better efficiency. And enthalpy classification goes together with this temperature. And uh, nature and geologic setting classification, organic system, the ring of fire that we have here. And the convective fracture control system and Iceland, Hawaii. Sedimentary systems, we have lots of those in Colorado, for example, in southern Colorado, in my state. And geopressure system, Mexico basin or um, southern coast of Texas. Off the coast, south of Texas, we have a large area of geopressure system. And um, um, hot dry rock. Have you ever heard this terminology, hot dry rock? No? Okay, so uh, maybe I would like to spend five minutes at least explaining this. And um, so all these things, volcanic systems and convective fracture trees, are very, very site specific. Right? You have to go to look for these resources. You have to go to a very specific area. So the U.S. government doesn't like it. The U.S. government wants to do geothermal everywhere in the continent of North America. So the idea is that if we can drill many 10 kilometers if you are too ambitious, you are almost guaranteed to hit a very hot but dry ground. Okay? So the idea is that all you need is water and permeability. So if you can locate these hot rocks, 
And if you know how to drill 10 kilometers deep, and you can drill it, and you get hydro fracture, and you can recover this cold water as a hot steam at other end. And the first project was called at the Fenton Hill at Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. And this is where the nuclear bombs were developed. So you don't see the immediate connection, but the connection is that New uh, Los Alamos Laboratory has done a lot of underground nuclear detonation tests. So they feel like they know how to fracture block in the very, very deep underground. So they want to try this, how the nuclear detonated uh, uh, fracture block behave like a permeable block at the very, very deep underground. Water and, and actually, the Central Hill project was, uh, was not a complete failure. So they drilled two uh, very, very deep, three to four kilometers at this site. And one, one well is deeper than the other well. So when, when using the deep bubble, they created a penny shaped fracture. So, and they did the same thing here. And it, with the hope that they can connect these two fractured zones. These are penny shaped but very, very uh, narrow or slim fractures. So um, they did actually um, generate electricity, but not much. Not, not enough um, for the money that spent. They spent millions and millions and millions of dollars, but the outcome was. But they have learned a lot how difficult to make the connection between two wells. Okay, the very, very deep underground. First of all, the way blocks fractures, um, they, they have this um, naive idea that uh, these hot rocks are very, very, have no pre existing micro fractures. But there is no such a thing. A very, very tight uh, rock, but still, the, the, when they fracture, hydro fractures, I think the <coughs> other closed fractures start opening up, and they, there was no control for the direction of the floor, the, the connection using the fracture. So, um, yeah, a few slides that shows the different types of. Uh, um, um, the reservoir, convective fracture control system, organic system, it's a very simple system here, and sedimentary system. Now, um, in, in the United States, um, at the Department of Energy, we have a, a small geothermal energy uh, department. And we have been told that the geothermal group has to work with an oil and gas. For obvious reasons. Oil and, oil and gas is a much bigger operation, and they can afford to make a few mistakes. And geothermal is a very, very small industry. So $10 million, $10 million of oil, and if we make mistakes, and people say, oh, it's just geothermal, they don't know what they do. We have to borrow um, um, some the, the, the foundation from oil and gas and uh, start learning a little bit more about how the training is done. So actually, um, we are also doing um, another work on a sedimentary basin, which traditionally for oil and gas. But we start doing uh, geothermal uh, work in a sedimentary And now hydrofracturing, hydrofracturing, hydrofracking is a very, very fashionable thing to talk about in, in the US. But this hydrofracture, the original concept of hydrofracture came from this Fenton Hill project. Remember that, just a penny-shaped fracture? 
And if you can make this penny-shaped fracture zone, many, many of them in a series using a horizontal fracture, so that becomes a hybrid fracture concept that they are so proud of now. Now, um, so this is a very, very um, simple model of geothermal reservoir. It's a surface, it's a well, and if you can identify <coughs> the volume of the geothermal um, reservoir, then you, do, you can do the analysis. And oftentimes, <coughs> we, uh, um, we start working with a, a, a picture like this. There's a well, and there's cold water. Remember that uh, fracture has a cold water zone, column of cold water. That's the driving force for this reservoir, hot water, going up. You can write um, the different equations with the hope that this Little only flow equation is, is reasonable enough to uh, uh, for us to be able to connect the pressure difference to the flow rate. Um, Extraction. Geothermal is a heat extraction. And the four sedimentary rocks for, uh, for petroleum and the horizontal <coughs> extent. The petroleum industry is more worried about how extent is reasonable in the horizontal direction. Okay. And mass transport is important. They do not care about the temperature, but they do not used to care about the temperature. Geothermal fractured rock, vertical extent, because we want to gain as much heat as possible, so we want to go deeper to have access to hotter temperature. And heat and mass transport are both important. So the analysis of the whole geothermal reservoir for uh, geothermal is much more complicated than the petroleum <coughs> Now, it is interesting to note that difference between mass extraction and heat extraction, because traditionally, petroleum industry stopped drilling when the hydrocarbon start, started going down, and that corresponds to the temperature of 880 degrees, 190 degrees, some of that. But that's when the geothermal people are becoming more and more interested, right? Because remember the, the classification of the geothermal reservoir in terms of temperature, 180 degrees above, that's a very, very good resource. So there has been a very, very clear distinction between the, the depth, in, uh, in terms of the depth between petroleum and um, geothermal. But guess what? Petroleum, they are running out of the locations, the shallow locations to have good access to the petroleum. So now they are going deeper and deeper. So now they start experiencing a hotter temperature, which caused which some problems. But for us, it's an opportunity because we can now, uh, what we call the co production. Okay? So a lot of petroleum products comes out with a very, very hot water. And if we know how to separate hot water from the petrol, then you can use that hot, hot temperature water for geothermal purposes. Okay? So, um, just to skip. So this is a typical, uh, hopefully this is the first, maybe second round of a, a geothermal reservoir model. It has a, a geological information and, and it is 
this is a very, very high resistivity uh, region. That means, that means there's no water, right? The rock is very, very resistive in terms of electric current. And um, um, so, but this is um, low resistivity cap. So we know where the water is, we know the temperature because of the poor drilling. So we have uh, um, the geological information and the hydrologic information and also the thermal information. So at this, this uh, geothermal reservoir should, the model should contain those vital information. But the most up, updated um, presentation of geothermal reservoir should look something like this. There are some, some good um, simulation tools that we can use. But remember, all this, except for these finite number of points, these are all infrared. So the way we make sure to improve the understanding of the reservoir is to work with this and with the real field and to keep monitoring the performance of the reservoir and keep changing the, uh, the model. Right? So it is very, very important once you develop a geothermal power plant together with the resources underground because what you can generate depends on what the underground can give. And if there's a large uncertainty in what's happening underground, so you really have to keep monitoring the performance of what's above ground um, that's defined by the underground reservoir. So now I have been you know, 10 more minutes. I've been <coughs> focusing on the power generation. But the most updated sort of a ways of uh, the most current thinking about geothermal among the communities is not there. It's not that. Power generation is something that a government is, is good at because utility scale power generation. We're talking about what, minimum 30 megawatts. And no, no one community can, uh, uh, they can do it, but, but uh, uh, they don't need to do it. So uh, the current thinking is that, and this, this idea is spreading very, very fast. How, what can we do using the heat of the geothermal water? Right? I mean, power generation is also done using the heat, but you have to have a very, very high temperature. But if you, uh, if you have hot springs, for example, that can give you 60 degree water, and you give up, say, well, it's not good for power generation. That is true, but it's good for many, many other things. And we have been kind of neglecting the usage of heat. Now, the reason this concept is picking up so fast is what happened in Japan. In 2011, we had a Overnight, we had to shut down every one of them. And we lost 30% of the electricity overnight. But how do you suck? I mean, Japan uses so much energy, right? In, in that country, if you lose 30% of electricity tonight, what did, how do they survive? Not by choice, but by necessity, they had to conserve energy. And that summer, this was, uh, this was in March, and 
that summer in Tokyo, the living in Tokyo was kept. It's very hot, very humid, but so they decided to put the maybe office curtains down during the daytime. And uh, so they learned by necessity how to conserve energy. And what they also learned is that they could do it. One summer, they could do it. The second summer, I said, well, you said, again, we're going to have this hot, wet summer again, and people's comfort level it was compromised. So people are like that, you know, they, I mean, every, when, when they are hit by a very, very bad accident, they, they work together and they are okay to survive. But you cannot do this every year. The right? second year was more difficult. Third year, people start complaining, well, tell me do something. Then they start reopening the very dirty old coal fire by necessity. So things like Kyoto protocols are now out of the window because Japan is generating so much CO2 at this point. Okay. But one thing they learned is that the money they this well, the conserved energy, so each company saved a lot of money by conserving energy or electricity. So so what it did was Many companies did not have to pay as much tax as before. When a company grows, they make more money, but the money you make, you have to pay tax. Right? So this is the traditional growth pattern in, in, with an economy. But first, conserving electricity, the money you conserve, there is no tax on it. So they didn't, they didn't realize that, but how, how important so this all of this geothermal heat, the geothermal heat can be used to heat or cool. Right? It, it's, a, it's a reverse cycle. So you can use to benefit local in the best way for the local. Now, as I said, integrated flow of geothermal some exploration of geothermal resource and, and uh, utilization of heat. We do not, we do not mine electrons from underground. We mine heat. Okay. So we mine heat, and the uh, heat is good enough. Then we have the option of power generation. And if it's not good enough, then we can still use the direct the heat directly without producing the power. <coughs> okay? Now, today, I think in Japan especially, if one wants to <coughs> develop a geothermal power plant, they are forced to have this component as well. Because the water hot water they use to generate electricity and, and after generating electricity that water is still hot so you can use this as a heat source so from here go here and, and they use that heat to benefit the society it's called the cascading music so but one thing that we have not really pay attention nowhere is that uh, every step there are stakeholders of different types, there are communities of different types. So in, in the old picture, well, if we have the state of the art skill set to understand what is underground together with financing, together with money, you could have gone to anywhere, basically, and said, well, we're going to do this, so let, let's build a park. 
and you know, in the mining is is the same way. I have I have extensively traveled southern uh, Peru. And I go I go to the remote areas and I tell them that I'm here to understand the geothermal resources. But for the low, for the village people, the mining and geothermal are the same thing. Because in, in the past history but, I mean, no matter how I do it, I'm disturbing their land, right? So it, it, this is becoming very, very important. So in my school, at least in my research or my class, I do this community um, relationship with stakeholder understanding. Before I talk about Jotham, And also, geothermal development, I mean, if you go to a, a new site, it takes a minimum 10 years to, to see something is happening. And usually, community relationship and, and the stakeholder does this work or actually put that at the very end. But that's the wrong approach. You have to do this at the very beginning. So you have acceptance by the community, by the society, then you can do all these things. The most Expensive failure was about seventy million dollar well. Can you imagine that? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm running out of time, but uh, um, uh, geothermal potential in Peru. And there are two major documents that I know. One is the document published by this institution, and there's a JICA master plan. And um, um, the first time I, I, I give a lecture in Peru, not here, um, somebody asked me, when can we start generating 3.6 gigawatts of electricity from geothermal? And it, that message came from, I think it's JICA report, right? But, but most of the <coughs> assessments are coming from geochemistry samples. And there are few drilling and exploration. Have there been any actual geothermal drilling done in southern Peru? I know there is an EDC also. But do you know anything? I don't think I don't think we have any done drilling yet, right? So the understanding the current understanding is nothing but joking or uh, surface exploration. Right? So there's a there's a large uncertainty in, in, in resource. And this is a this is a, not a disadvantage. This is a huge opportunity for you, right? Because you, you can you can start helping new field and large area the concentrated locations in southern Peru and, and in all these areas is a, a request project for authorization there many many of them are focused in that area and this is a um, so this is what I did with the, uh, with the Filipino company called EDC. And we hire local people go to a very, very remote area. This is near Chibari. And we went also for the canyon. But the, the problem is this here. We have to do 5,000 meters, 6,000 meters. We have to use mules and, and horses to carry our cable or territory. You know, it's very, very difficult. And there's no way we can, we can take a big a seismic uh, machines or big machineries. So <coughs> it's, it's, it's a challenge. But at the end, we somehow find a uh, hot springs like this. But this is, um, this is a little old now, 2011. When I was given this, this charge, first I was very, very discouraged. 
But then two seconds later, I say, well, this is a really opportunity for us because as a university professor, I can talk to the government people such as you or other universities and start developing their capabilities inside of Peru, within a Peru. And uh, uh, for example, here, how many have 106 geologists, and most of them are here. No? Okay. And the geochemist 32, geophysicist 17, reasonable engineer 5. I'm a little bit surprised if we actually have reasonable engineer. Drilling engineers 10, power engineers 60, environmental scientists 101. I think we have many more environmental scientists now than in 2011. But, the, but the, the point is, look at this. So places like uh, uh, San Marcos or UTEC or, or other universities are very, very looking at this series. Okay. So they have to work with the government if they want to. So I uh, I just ran out of time, but this is a, uh, this is my project in southern Colorado, Rico, and this is a completely integrated approach to develop geothermal resources. And the community is actually driving this. Okay. But if I if I have a chance next time I come back here, I will share this. this so thank you very much.